Good evening, everyone. From our studios in Caracas, Venezuela, my name is Cody Weddle. We begin with tonight's headlines. No peace until justice has been served. The FARC and the Colombian government continue talks in Cuba. Brazil receives a warning to clean up its act ahead of the COP21 summit in Paris. Plus, former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak to face trial for the last time. The details on those stories and more right now from the South. Hello again, thanks for joining us to begin uh, this evening. The six month time frame for a final peace agreement between the FARC and the government of Colombia will only begin when talks regarding justice have been concluded. Now that's according to FARC leaders. This is the thorniest issue of the peace talks that started in late 2012 with several questions regarding the penalties to be paid by those responsible for crimes against humanity and war crimes. Now another point of discussion is that while the government claims that the pact reached last month for a special jurisdiction for peace is a firm agreement, but still in development, the FARC says it is closed and should be published in full. This debate, which will have to be analyzed at the table when we try to work out when the issue of justice will be concluded definitely, at that moment we will be able to see when to start counting six months. And the Colombian president, Juan Manuel Santos, apologized for the victims of the 1985 Palace of Justice siege in which 98 people were killed when police and military officials stormed the building occupied by M-19 guerrillas. The bodies of three of the victims were found just recently. The guerrilla group had occupied the building demanding that the then president, Belisario Bentacur, be tried after the army had violated a ceasefire with the guerrillas. And another military operation uh, to tell you about on Tuesday in Colombia's Uruba region ended with 12 presumed members of the Usuga drug gang killed. Authorities say that the operation was against drug trafficking gangs in the area and that 14 rifles, one machine gun, one mortar, grenades and anti-personnel mines were also seized. They establish a camp with an important capacity to attack public forces, especially police, and offer security for deliveries of drugs from the sea or through the Tampon de Darren rainforest at the border of Panama. Marijuana legalization could be closer uh, to taking effect in Mexico. The Supreme Court has ruled in favor of a civil organization of four individuals demanding being allowed to grow crops for rec recreational use. Now, the case was first brought in 2013. This Wednesday, the court set a precedent by voting four to one that prohibiting people from consuming the drug was un unconstitutional. This could pay for the decriminalization of marijuana in a country with a bloody history of conflict with drug cartels. The Cuban president, Raul Castro, will visit Mexico on Thursday, nearly 60 years after setting sail from the port of Yucatan to launch uh, the Cuban Revolution alongside his brother, Fidel. On November 26, 1956, Fidel Castro and a band of 82 armed comrades led, led by him, his brother Raul and Che Guevara, sailed off from, the, from, uh, from Cuba from the Gulf, to Cuba from the Gulf of Mexico in the leaky Grama yacht to start the revolution that would end up ousting dictator Fulgencio Batista. Now, the Castros had been secretly training rebels in the Mexican highlands. The Grand Mayotte has said to have been named after the grandmother of its original owner. The travelers under the command of Fidel were in Mexico seeking a means of transportation to reach Cuba and fulfill the promise they had made in 1956 to become free or to become martyrs. With the help of a Mexican national named Antonio Conde, they managed to purchase the Grand Maya yacht from a U.S. company, which was a tourism yacht with a 20-passenger capacity and where they carried 82 men, commanded by Fidel. Within the group were Raul Castro, Juan Almeida, 
and Ernesto Che Guevara. Dentro del grupo estaba. Argentina's presidential uh, candidate Daniel Scioli is promising to do more for the nation's pensioners, continuing the work of his Front for Victory party. Now, Scioli has uh, been on the road campaigning as polls show that he and his conservative rival, Mauricio, Ma Mauricio Macri, are currently running neck and neck in the figures. Scioli recently visited a retirement center as he reiterates his aim to do what he has to in order to take care of Argentina's pensioners. You know that during the campaign, everyone speaks about pensioners. But it's been our project, our space, Baronism, and our Fund for Victory that took care of 3.5 million pensioners. I promise now to increase your pension funds, to protect our pensioners' health insurance, and to do what I have to do. Argentinian scientists and researchers have also started participating in the presidential campaign there. Members of the National Commission for Scientific and technical research are calling for the continuation of the state support for scientific activities. From Buenos Aires now, our correspondent Laudiana Ponce with more. The improvement in the state-funded scheme of scientific research activities is often considered among the most important transformations Argentina has gone through under the government of President Cristina Fernandez from for victory. This is why the scientific community has started participating in the presidential campaign supporting Daniel Scioli in the road to the runoff election. I teach in several public universities and it is great to see kids that 10 years ago would not have been able to go to college and today they can dream about a career, about becoming researchers or reaching a PhD. Kids that 10 years ago would be attending protests. I have no doubt about it. Members of Argentina's National Commission for Scientific and Technical Research, CONICET, issued a communique in which they point out that since 2003 the government doubled the budget for science and technology and the total amount of scholarships increased by 400 percent, and they call for the continuation of such policies. The improvement in income level for researchers being able to travel and to have funding for our project is unprecedented, not only in recent years, but in Argentine history. And that is why changing this course would mean taking a step back. The creation of the Science and Technology Ministry in 2007 and the return of more than 1,000 scientists are also seen by these researchers as some of the achievements that could be endangered if the right-wing candidate Mauricio Macri would become president. Um, I believe that we would lose all that we have achieved, no doubt, and that research, just like Mauricio Macri has proposed, would only be destined to those projects that could be used for profit. While under previous neoliberal administrations, scientists had to flew over to find a job, in the last year Argentina was able to fully build its own satellites under state management. These two models will face each other on the November 22 runoff. Laureano Ponce, Telesur, Buenos Aires. The government of Ecuador criticized the rule by the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes that obliges the South American country to pay over a billion dollars to the U.S.-based oil firm Occidental Petroleum, also known as Oxy. This is a 40% reduction from the original ruling that compelled Ecuador to pay $1.77 billion. Now, in 2006, the government of Alfredo Palacios terminated a contract that gave Oxy permission to explore oil fields in the Amazon basin and extract 100,000 barrels per day, alleging that the company had sold 40 percent of its shares without the government's consent. As the world uh, prepares for the highly anticipated COP21 climate change summit in Paris, which begins at the end of November, Brazil is, beginning, uh, is, is being warned rather that it must take further action to clean up its environment. The warning uh, comes from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which recognized Brazil's progress made in reducing deforestation and greenhouse gas emissions, but added that the country's uh, worsening economy is casting a shadow on that po progress. The OECD said that Brazil is the biggest destroyer, destroyer of forests in the world. Brazil's environment minister said that they will try harder.
One of the challenges we face in the next year is, in terms of climate, reducing our emissions of greenhouse gases by 2030 to a level lower than we had in the 90s. We work hard for that goal. The National Electoral Council here in Venezuela performed this Wednesday the audit of the indelible ink to be used at December's elections. Now 12 political parties, both government supporters as well as um, uh, those opposing the government, took part in the process in which 200 cans of ink were audited. The same protocol was used in last uh, elections when there were, were no claims by any political group. And the Venezuelan president, Nicolas Maduro, he has bet his mustache that he will meet his target of building one million homes before next year. Now this is part of the Great Housing Mission in Venezuela, a subsidized housing initiative started by the late president, Hugo Chavez, in 2011 for families living in poverty. Coming up after the break, former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak is due to face a court once more for the death of 239 people. That story and more when we come back. divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Lines. Watch it on telesurtv.net slash English. Telesur, wherever the news, you'll be there. A world infinitely connected. Millions of people instantaneously interacting. Experiences relayed in 144 characters millions of lives in every corner of the planet. They're not tweets, they're stories. Watch it on telesurtv.net slash English. Telesur, wherever the news, you'll be there. Rod Stars, G1, and Claudia De La Cruz are Rebel Diaz, hip-hop activists positioned within a history of political resistance through music. And you don't stop. They invite young people to express themselves about their social struggles. And you don't stop. Watch it on telesurtv.net slash English. Telesur, wherever the news, you'll be there. A final trial will take place for former Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak on Thursday. Now this is he faces a court over the deaths of 239 pro-democracy demonstrators during the 2011 uprising that saw him kicked out of office. Mubarak was initially tried for this back in August 2011, but was acquitted in November 2014. However, prosecutors appealed his acquittal, which was accepted by the court. The former leader is currently in jail for embezzlement at a military hospital in Cairo. About nine people have been killed and several others wounded after a suicide bomber rode into a policeman's club in the Sinai Peninsula. Sinai province is the local affiliate of the Daesh extremist group and have reportedly assumed responsibility for the attack. The group there has been responsible for the deaths of hundreds of police officers in the past few months. Syria's army forces say they have uh, reclaimed the major road that runs from Aleppo through the towns of Kasnar and Ithra and links up with the cities of Hama and Homs further south. Now say, they say this is a major blow to the Daesh group, which had taken control of the road in October. The last few weeks of fighting have focused on retaking territory around Aleppo from jihadist and anti-Assad fighters. We'll, we'll go now to our correspondent, Hazem Abdullah, in Syria. After heavy battles with ISIS extremists, the Syrian army says it has taken complete control of the Aleppo Khanasir Athria Road in the northern Syria, even as far as Hama and Homs, in the center of the country. Syrian progress on the ground with clear and strong Russian support has changed the conflict into a major confrontation between world powers. 
the money paid by the Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar to create a large army of mercenaries on behalf of the Islamic Jihad will soon backfire on them in the light of the significant progress of the Syrian army. The importance of this road lies in it being the army's main supply line, as well as the fact that it connects with the west of Aleppo, where about two million people live. Analysts see that this could lead in the next phase to lifting the siege in the towns of Nippol and Zahra, northwest of Aleppo. It will also make it easier to supply the troops who are moving to lift the siege on Quares airport. <laughs> We are the men of the PDF in the towns of Al Safa and Nibul. We will stay on this land and that is part of our blood. When we derive our strength from the men of the Syrian Arab army, we are ready to defend our land with all our strength in the face of terrorism. The military operation has been continuously supported with the heavy air cover by Russian jets. The Russian chief operation officer Andrei Kartopolov said the Russian Air Force has carried out raids on 2,000 ISIS targets in Syria since the start of the campaign. He added that the air operation in Syria will continue as long as the Syrian army needs it. Hazem Abdullah, Tilisu, Syria. Palestine's President Mahmoud Abbas says that Israeli aggressions must stop. Now this is the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, met to address the escalating violence as well as rising tensions between Palestinian and Israeli authorities. Now Abbas said, quote, Israel has to abide by the so-called status quo as it was before 2000 and not by what is imposed today under the name of status quo, which is untrue, not precise, and a distortion of reality, end quote. As the violence continues between uh, protesting Palestinians and Israeli forces, more and more people are dying there. With an update now on what many believe is an ongoing infatad, uh, Telesur's Noor Harazin now reports. After 30 days of continuous unrest in the West Bank and occupied Jerusalem, clashes are still intense. Scenes of stabbing, people being run over, Israeli soldiers, Palestinians being killed hour after hour, and injured people at hospitals mark the everyday lives of Jerusalem's residents. Palestinian analyst Talal Okal believes that the uprising will continue to escalate in the absence of political initiatives and international pressure. He points out that Palestinian political factions have roles. Tilisur met with Akram Atallah, another political analyst, who stated that the future of this intifada is still unknown. He also ruled out that the uprising would take an armed charger. Nobody expected these events to start or to continue for a whole month. It is difficult to predict the future course of events in the absence of an open role by the Palestinian factions. It is a feeling of rage which expresses itself. Israel's actions will determine whether this uprising will continue or will stop. It depends on whether Israel will step back or step up its repressive measures, including the detention of those who throw stones. Meanwhile, the Palestinian Ministry of Health announced recently that the number of Palestinians killed by Israeli fire since October across the Palestinian territories reached 74, with more than 2,240 wounded. Nurharzin Tresu TV, Gaza. Recep Tayyip Erdogan, Turkey's president, is requesting more presidential powers in the form of a new constitution. Now, it's something he has been calling on now for over a decade. Erdogan's AK party recently won in the parliamentary elections, winning 317 seats in the 550-member parliament in a process that many international observers said was unfair and characterized by too much violence and fear. Erdogan said he may hold a referendum if his bid for constitutional reform does not get the parliamentary support it requires to be passed. All those who oppose the demand of our people for a new constitution, those who try to stop us, will pay the price in four years at the next elections. And they burned U.S., British, Israeli and Saudi flags, but said that their intention is not to insult the American nation. Protesters, including students, rallied outside the U.S. Embassy in Tehran saying that they are targeting the U.S.'s policies, arrogance, and Islam. And this all happens on the annual anniversary of the takeover of the U.S. Embassy in 1979 in support of the Iranian Revolution.
And now we take a quick look at some of the other stories making the news around the world. After 10 years of conservative rule in Canada, liberal politician Justin Trudeau was sworn in as the country's 29th prime minister. The 43-year-old Trudeau won the race after he campaigned on a platform to create jobs through infrastructure projects and to reject austerity. <laughs> London police made several arrests after protest action there turned violent. Students were demonstrating with calls to end student tuition fees and in favour of maintenance grants. Police officers made arrests for what they called public order offences on the Yemeni coast. There are reports of infrastructure damage and heavy flooding in certain areas. Neighboring countries have flown in relief supplies to assist the victims. And so far, 16 people have been found dead after a factory under construction collapsed in the Pakistani city of Lahore. Rescue workers are still working to locate as many as 150 possible survivors. Reports say that as many as 200 people were inside the building when it collapsed. For the first time, a woman has won the coveted Melbourne Cup and the winner, Michelle Payne, will take home close to $4.5 million as a reward. Now Payne, who is the only the fourth female jockey to ride in the Melbourne Cup's 155-year history, said that she had to believe that she would win the title. She added that, quote, it's such a chauvinistic sport. I know some of the owners wanted to kick me off, end quote. Her horse, named Prince of Penzenance, cost only $50,000. <laughs> and to close this evening, a French novel that gives uh, the account of a Jewish family during the occupation has won the prestigious French literary prize, the Femina. Now, the novel is called La Cache, authored by Christiane Boltanaski. The Femina's foreign novel category has awarded a Carrie Hudson and is called Zone to Internet. It describes a love story about a young migrant woman from Russia and a security guard. As we're covering uh, this evening, remember to check us out on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, for more on all of those and other stories, also check out our website, telesurtv.net slash English. For Telesur English, I'm Cody Weddle. We'll see you back here tomorrow.